wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Does anybody know who said that? Yes, Al Johnson. Well done. It was Al Johnson in the groundbreaking movie, The Jazz Singer, which at its premiere in New York in October 6, 1927, was the very first spoken voice to be heard in the feature film. Cecilia, I thought you might have known, been there, been there even. When? <laughs> <laughs> the moment actually came in the middle of the film when during a nightclub scene, Jolson suddenly spoke. How's that for dramatic effect? The reaction by the theatre audience was immediate. <clears throat> they rose to their feet, applauding ecstatically. From this breakthrough point of the film, liberal use was made of the new medium. In one scene, Jolson sits at the piano and exchanges lines with his mother between verses of blue skies. Blue skies smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see. Does the premier ring a bell for you now, Cliff? <laughs> Al Johnson, Al Johnson also ad-libbed various lines during the musical sequences of the film, and these were left in. The words, you ain't heard nothing yet, were truly prophetic in light of the massive advances taken in the realms of movie sound since that time. Another quote, action is more generally understood than words. Like Chinese symbolism, it will mean different things according to its scenic connotation. Listen to a description of some unfamiliar object, an African warthog, for instance. Then look at a picture of the animal and see how surprised you are. Does anybody know who said that? It was Charlie Chaplin in uh, February 1931, <coughs> article in Time magazine. He very much saw film as a visual rather than an auditory medium. Chaplin resisted making a talkie all through the 1930s, although some of the films did have a soundtrack, and I'll pick up on this in a minute. The title of my speech this evening is The Art of Silence. Two things that have happened over the last few weeks have inspired my selection. <coughs> the first is the film The Artist starring Jean Dujardin, which you have probably read about and may have seen, in, and which in spite of stiff competition won seven awards at the BAFTAs the other night, and I think is predicted by various sources down for five awards on this Sunday coming. The second inspiration for my speech was the release last Friday under the 30-year rule, the news that Chaplin had an extensive MI5 file. For those of you who don't know, MI5 is the British security service charged with counterintelligence and internal security. I've resorted to various websites and newspapers in my research. Are there any film buffs in the in audience who are going to contradict me? <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> Personally, I do enjoy mine as a performer in art, and hence do appreciate the work of the great silent film comedians of the time, although I can't say I'm an aficionado. Chaplin's films have been compared to those of Buster Keaton and Howard Lloyd. It's interesting how the three have different styles. Despite his resistance, Chaplin slowly capitulated to the dominance of sound for several reasons. One of these was with the coming of the Great Depression and the rise of fascism in Europe. Chaplin began to perceive himself somewhat of an international public field figure with social responsibilities. This caused him to be increasingly concerned with the message of his art. These messages included a critique of industrial working conditions in the USA and the strong critique of the fascist regime of Adolf Hitler 
through the film The Great Dictator. Turns out that MI5 opened a file on Chaplin whilst he was being hounded by the FBI for alleged communist sympathies. It may be that the, the verbal as well as the visual messages in his film was an element in bringing into the attention of the old man, J. Edgar Hoover. MI5 were apparently asked by the FBI to find out where Chaplin was born and pursue suggestions that his real name was Israel Thornstein. It had always been assumed that Chaplin was born in Walworth, down in South London, on the 16th of April, 1889. MI5 found no record of his birth at Somerset House, which was where the birth records were kept at that time. The MI5 files report that no evidence that Chaplin's name is or has ever been Israel Thornstein. A suggestion that he may have been born in France came to nothing. As an aside, more recent uh, research post Chaplin's death suggested he was born in a caravan in Smevic near Birmingham. <laughs> the newly released file shows that whilst communist sympathies were the determining factor for the FBI, for MI5 the issue was whether Chaplin had ever presented a security risk to the country, and in its view it made it clear he wasn't. One thing I didn't realise, that the United States actually prevented Chaplin from returning to America after a visit to Europe in 1953. He denied ever being a communist, but decided not to contest the US ban, <coughs> and instead lived in Switzerland until his death in 1977. I am a victim of lies and vicious propaganda, he said. I hope you found the facts I've incorporated into this evening's speech of interest. The task for me to now is to see the artist while the sits still on general release. Thank you very much for listening.